So, forgive me for bringing this out, but this issue is much, much deeper than a vaccination needle. That's a symptom of the disease. Okay? It will be causing the disease, but it's a symptom of a much bigger disease state, a bigger cancer. Now I can go on for an hour or two and show you the proof, the absolute proof, that in the year 1997, a team of so-called scientists went up to a little place in the Horn of Alaska, right off a gnome, a little place called Brevik Mission, Alaska, with one sole intent, one sole mission. You see, they knew that this little town back in 1918, this little Inuit Eskimo village, was decimated by this 1918 virus. Eighty residents of this small little town, 76 of them died. 76 of the 80, because it was the middle of winter, their bodies were stacked like cordwood waiting for the tundra to thaw enough to bury. In the middle of the summer, a mass grave was opened up and they did in fact bury these 70, 75 bodies in one mass grave. The matron of the village was quite a heavy set lady. The Inuit culture is, 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 is matrionic, they have matriarchs much like the Navajo Nation does here in America. But anyway, this woman was obese, quite heavy set, and so she was, because of her, her, her position as matron, was not put in this mass grave, was put in a separate grave. Well, the team of scientists from Fort Detrick U.S. Institute of Pathology in Rockville, Maryland, our own government, went on and uh, had a lot of cash, a lot of, a lot of hard, cold uh, wads of cash, and they basically bribed the Inuit people up there to allow, allow them to desecrate this mass grave, open it up, trying to find a killer virus fragment. For two weeks, they sifted through these bodies, some, some more decomposed than others, with pinking shears cutting into their lungs, trying to find this killer virus, at least a fragment of it, if not the whole virus. For two weeks, they worked and toiled, and they were unsuccessful. They didn't find what they were looking for. Then they understood, wait a minute, let's, let's look at this other grave, this matron, and she, gave them what they were looking for. Her name was, they named her Lucy. They exhumed her body because of the, the rolls of fat on her body. Her lung material was intact and they were able to find this virus. Now, understand this. Anything in nature, and I'm taking, talking to you now as a naturopath, Naturopathy lets, like April said, lets the body heal itself. Give the body the tools it needs and let it do its God-given work. <laughs> the human body is a miracle of God. It does amazing things if allowed to do it. Whenever something abnormal that's not part of natural cycles, typically it will wreak a lot of havoc if it's, if it's created by man. But luckily, nature provides safeguards, and this virus followed the role of nature. It went basically in, it went instinct, it went, uh, became totally non existent anymore. After 1918, the, it was so instinct that, that nobody knew about it anymore. Nobody had any problems. It was gone. It basically removed its viral components and went back the way of the dodo bird, went extinct. Thank God, protects us. 
My point is this. What would possess a team of scientists from our Department of Defense to want to go and find this extinct virus and with the sole intent of reverse engineering it and recreating it in the lab testing. Why? Arguably the worst virus ever to plague mankind with many as 50 million deaths worldwide. Why would you want to play with this thing? It's gone. It's history. Well, it's because of one thing. In the U.S. military, unfortunately, weaponized biological weapons are big business. You can argue that, well, we wanted to do it before the Russians did it, or the Koreans, or the Chinese, but they were successful. They found this virus. The first report that was published on this virus research was published in Science Magazine in the year 1997. It was authored by Jeffrey Taubenberger. Taubenberger. This report told us a lot of very important things. He said in the report, this is a, quote, recombinant or reassortant virus. What that means in lay terms, it's not your typical human-based, what's called an H3N2 seasonal flu virus, which we all get on occasion. No, it was more detailed than that. It had bird flu, H5N1 components. It had swine flu components, H1N1. Triple recombinant genes. Now you'll hear, you'll hear some people say on the radio, even from this pulpit, that we can't prove anything. Hello, use your mind. How many recombinant genes do we see walking around Montana? or New York wings and chicken beaks and pig feet and curly pigtails and talk as a human. You see, God doesn't do that. We have genetic protection in our gene plates. When you start messing around with genes, you start having problems. You start playing God, you have problems. Well folks, a virus even though it's much tinier than much of our cells, the DNA is the same science. Understand that. To say a virus grabs onto gene clades by itself is like saying that God's going to make a pig, human, bird mutation all naturally. Doesn't happen. Now back in 1918, the scientists didn't know about viruses. But they knew all about vaccinations. They knew all about Edward Jenner's work and Pasteur's work. And this was the real golden age of vaccination. They thought it was all bacterial. When the Kaiser invaded uh, and, and, the, and the World War I started, and the trenches of France, one of the biggest fears Whenever you have large armies concentrated with no facilities for, for bathrooms and, and, and good drinking water and good food, the biggest killer on, on European battlefields historically has been typhus fever. Typhus, a waterborne disease. You get it from drinking bad water or being in contact with poor sanitation. So the labs of John D. Rockefeller back then Wow, with this great war, here's a chance to make untold millions by producing, at uh, first time, a typhus fever vaccine.